All right, welcome to the Septuagint uh, class. We're going to go through, uh, in this opening video, we're going to kind of look at your syllabus, make sure everybody's on the same page as far as what is required of you. Um, and then maybe if we get an opportunity, I might teach just a, a quick kind of uh, introduction to the Septuagint and, and what it is that we're dealing with in this course. So for this class, uh, the the obvious textbook then would be the Septuagint, right? Because most people do not have a copy of this. Um, there's there's essentially three kind of main strands of of translation, you know, um, because not many people have under undertaken this task of going back to original Greek manuscripts and translating the Septuagint into English. We have many versions of the Hebrew family of texts, the Masoretic texts, which the King James used and which most of our English Bibles today use. We've got all kinds of options for those. Um, not as many people have undertaken the task of going back in and translating the Septuagint, uh, the Greek texts of the Old Testament, into uh, modern day English, right? So. There are about three main ones. There's others, but uh, I guess there's a few others. But but in terms of mainstream ones that you could get at like a bookstore, uh, there's really only about three primary options. One is by Ralphs. Uh, probably in terms of accuracy and and uh, you know having the newer manuscripts to look at um, because you know as, as archaeology uncovers things, you get various uh, new discoveries that may help a little bit. So, I mean, there's not going to be anything drastically different between Rouse version and the one that we have, but there are some, some differences. Um, so, if, if, if I could choose any one that I would, I would probably prefer to have, it would be Rouse. Um, but the, the trouble with that one is it can be pricey. A lot of times it's between $60 and $100 for a copy of one of those. So for these classes, um, I didn't really want to do that. Feel free to get Ralph's if, if you would prefer that, but I leave that up to you. The one that, um, that I'm recommending for this class is a very good translation as well. It's Brenton's. He wrote his in 1850. So the difference is between 1850 and now, um, you know, Ralph's had um, some more manuscripts to look at and to analyze when he was preparing his translation than Britain had access to. Um, but Brenton's is still really great. This is um, probably the, the, the most um, well-read of them all, the most popular one, I guess you could say, in terms of uh, its uh, usage in current uh, studies and things. Although Ralph's, um, in terms of, you know, just for purely academics, Ralph's is probably definitely the choice um, in terms of just being a mainstream accessible copy. Brenton's is a choice because this one you can probably get for around $25. Um, and it's still a great translation. Uh, it, it's kind of nice the way that it is. It has the Greek uh, in the center and then on either side it has your English. So as you do some, some Greek studies later on uh, in life, a book like this can be good because then, you know, as you're reading the English, you might let your eyes kind of wander over onto your your Greek there and, and begin to look at that. Um, and then the third version is is a newer one um, that that just came out uh, a few years ago. But the trouble with that one is, and and I understand why that it is not it's not necessarily a trouble. It's just you need to understand the difference. The, the newer one that they have come out with, I believe it's called the NETS, um, it, uh, it, it uses as a base the, the NRSV, the, the New Revised Standard Version, which is a Hebrew-based text off the Masoretic text. And so basically what they've decided to do is, is they will use the Masoretic text except for in places where it differs from the Septuagint then they go back in and translate that um, with, with the hopes then that, that the NRSV versions sections where they just quote it in, in the, uh, the way that the NRSV has already translated it 
would allow for uh, maybe more familiarity for some people in the, in the wording of it because it's not their new translation. It's 80% a translation that's it's fairly common. Uh, and then, then they are providing their own wording for the, the, the portions of Scripture that are different between the Septuagint, the Greek version, and the Hebrew version. <clears throat> uh, so in that case, it's not a pure translation going back to the Hebrew, <clears throat> to the Greek rather. Um, so th that may not be an issue for some people. I think the bigger issue for me, um, I, I don't have a copy of that one, but from my understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, my understanding is that it is done in an interlinear style, which means, you know, kind of word for word, right, which, which can make things a little more choppy. Um, and so, so for that reason alone, I felt if you're going to have one copy of the Septuagint, probably Brenton would be the place to start. Um, but the, the NETS, uh, the newer one came out just a few years ago, is not a bad version. I'm just not sold on, uh, on the way they did it as being the right choice for a Septuagint class. Right? So it's not that it doesn't have value and that you may not want to get a copy of that later um, for some of your own studies. But in terms of being a pure Septuagint translation that we want to get for a class like this, I would either go with Brenton's or Ralph's. Ralph's is hard to find a copy of that for under 60 or so, you know. So, uh, so for the most part, we'll go with Brenton's. Brenton's also has, um, depending on, on who, you, who you hear, they will either call it the Septuagint Plus or the Apocrypha, right? Uh, and those, we'll talk about later uh, what those are uh, and why, you know, do we consider them authentic? Are they important? You know, how do we approach the Apocrypha? We'll look at that. But, but essentially the Apocrypha are books that were um, associated with uh, the early church. They were Greek texts that uh, were, were often... Uh, included in many of the canons of the early church, although sometimes they would give like a disclaimer that these books are, you know, good for teaching, but we don't consider them divine, but yet they still put them together in the canon. You get that sometimes, but, but there is no one definitive approach to the Apocrypha. It just depends on what little local church, city, community that you were looking at uh, to figure out how they approached their own canon, you know, because in the early church it wasn't necessarily uh, established. Now, the, the Hebrew part of it was the 22 books uh, that are included in the Hebrew canon, uh, which is our classic Old Testament. Um, there, there was never any, you know, doubt about those. So that was the Hebrew canon. The Septuagint, the Greek canon, included all of those, um, but then typically would also include some other things as well. Uh, and so we'll kind of look at that in a little bit. So, but those are included in here in a separate section in the back, right? So that you can go back in and read some of those because um, they're interesting as well. But in, but in another lesson, uh, maybe today if we get a chance, I'm not sure. Um, but but throughout the uh, the progress of this course. We'll take a look at, at those apocrypha as well. All right, so I want to go through this uh, the syllabus just a little bit here. Um, as you can see, you uh, the first six weeks, you don't really have anything due in this class, right? So what I'm really wanting you to do is just to spend some time um, getting your reading done. As you'll see, uh, for this assignment, what I've got you doing instead of a reading quiz is I've got you doing a reading plan, right? So it's pretty much on your honor system. I'm, I'm going to set up, um, it, it'll be like a reading quiz. You'll log in, but it's just going to have probably just one question. How far did you get in the reading plan, right? So it's on uh, the honor system, but, um, but that's how I'm going to do it for this class. So it's, you're not going to have to study anything for the reading quiz. What I'm wanting you to do is read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, in the Septuagint, right? And so you've got all eight weeks to do that. Um, so I would encourage you to, 
to take your time with it, uh, you know, pace yourself. I mean, don't take too much time, you don't get it done, but, but enjoy reading it and, and perhaps maybe even having your English Bible side by side to see any differences because you're going to need to have identified some differences uh, for your week seven paper, right? And so um, I would encourage you maybe to, to do some of your reading first and see if in your own reading some things don't, don't emerge. If in your own reading some things don't emerge where you say, okay, I, I see some differences I want to write about in my paper, then, then Google it, you know, and, and, you know, see what some, let, let some websites maybe point you in the right direction about some differences or some things like that. But, but I would encourage you to at least um, do some of your own reading first and just see if, if you notice any things uh, that seem to be different between the Greek versions and the Hebrew versions. Um, you know, and we'll talk about which one is more uh, reliable. I don't know that you can make a case that either one is more reliable. Uh, the, the, Hebrew, the Greek is a translation off of the early Hebrew, um, but the Hebrew that we have now has been passed down through all of that time. Um, and, uh, and so it, it's not that, that either one is... Um, is not prone to the things that happen as you translate, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that, that to approach it to say which one is more reliable may not be the best way. Probably the best thing to do is to approach the Septuagint and say this is, is like another translation. Ninety-something percent of this is going to be very similar to my Bible. There's going to be some word choice things that are a little different, right? Most of the stories and most of the content is exactly the same. The differences are going to come in the word choice. And that word choice comes all the way back to early Jewish translators. Because it's, to the best of our knowledge, the first versions of the Septuagint were translated by Jewish scholars who spoke the Hebrew and the Greek, and they were, they were trying to make a Greek version. And so they would have been um, very familiar not only with the Hebrew language and the Greek language, but also with uh, the world of the Bible, right? With, with how you, words were used in that culture, right? And so it's kind of neat to go back in and see then when they made a translation, what their word choices were. Kind of helps us to see and kind of compare a little bit when an English speaker looks back at that Hebrew and makes some choices about how to put it into English. Um, it, it's also kind of interesting to see then what uh, these early Hebrew scholars who knew that language very well and, and were closer to the culture to see the, the translation decisions that they made when they made their translation, right? So, um, and then, you know, then the Apocrypha is, is completely different because that's not in our English Bible. So for those sections, you're dealing with totally new material, right? Um, the non-apocrypha, the, the classic books that we also have in our English Bible, you don't get a whole lot of new material there. Um, some things in Daniel um, are, are different, uh, and there might be a, a few little things here and there. That's the main place, um, is that book of Daniel, um, where you'll see some differences. And in fact, in the apocrypha, we'll talk about that later, um, there are, are additions to the book of Daniel that were in the earliest Greek versions of Daniel, right? And so instead of them putting those additions into the main part of this book, they have them separate in the back, right? Because they, they may not, we'll, we'll get into that, they may not have been um, from Daniel himself. They, they could have just been attached to that book along the way. And so because there's a little uncertainty about that, they, most people will separate them and kind of put, um, it's called Susanna, and then the other one is Bell and the Dragon, is a story there. Um, and then there is also um, uh, the, uh, the, the song of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is, uh, that they sang in the Fiery Furnace, is included in the Greek manuscripts, but not in the Hebrew. Um, so Daniel tends to have some differences, and interestingly enough, many of uh, the Old Testament canons, like 
it wasn't the Hebrew was was fairly well set how the Hebrew people ordered their books um, but how Greek communities ordered their Old Testament was was often very different um, and so uh, there are many that put Daniel not even with the prophets but they put him with the writings like Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes so you get it's kind of interesting when you get into it we, we tend to think in just very clear lines like okay what was the Greek text like back then what was the Hebrew text like back then but the reality is you know back then they didn't have a lot of communication I mean if you're in a city you may not even ever leave that city hardly and so they would make some of their own choices about their own order and so when you actually go back in and study some of these early things it was not just a unified choice um, you get different regions um, structuring things slightly different all right okay so uh, as far as your um, as far as your syllabus goes you've got your differences paper right that's due in week seven uh, five to seven pages um, and use whatever sources you feel that you need to make the paper interesting and, and fulfill its purpose right um, so if you need a few sources several sources whatever you need uh, you're getting to your senior level stuff so I'm going to kind of leave the the source count to you um, and so you know do whatever you feel that you need for this class right uh, and then you have your final in week eight you've got three discussion boards week two four and six um, and then probably in this class uh, some of your other uh, concentration courses I did in a kind of a at your own pace style you know what I'm saying where I'd give you three or four lectures but most of it was independent study um, probably for this class I'm going to deviate from that and your next class as well in your concentration and I'm going to try and give you videos each week um, and so it'll be run more like a standard class um, because I've got quite a few things um, that I want to share about you know kind of the evolution of the Septuagint and stuff like that all right okay um, in terms of just an opening kind of quick thought I, I'll, I'll share the story as we have it right um, of the Septuagint proper so when I say the Septuagint proper, um, really the story of the Septuagint, of the, the LXX, the 70, right? How 70 translators, if you haven't heard that, um, that is the story behind this, that 70 translators translated this um, in 70 days, right? Um, but the idea, the, the story is not about the entire Old Testament, it's just about the Torah, right? So the Septuagint itself was not the entire Old Testament. The Septuagint that this was translated by these 70 Hebrew scholars was the Torah. Right? And along the way, the other books of the Old Testament found their way to being translated into Greek as well. Um, but in terms of who did it, when they did it, uh, that we don't know. Um, so the only one that we have a story connected with is that original translation of the Septuagint uh, and in fact there are actually some other versions of this story as well that kind of hint at that there was an initial translation of the Torah done into Greek by five scholars but it didn't turn out very good and so the king ordered another version done but he wanted more people working on it um, so the king in question here that according to the story that ordered this was King Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus Ptolemy Philadelphus of Egypt King Ptolemy Philadelphus uh, of Egypt so the reason he's not called Pharaoh is because he was not from these Egyptian lines. Basically, when Alexander the Great expanded the Greek Empire and they kind of took over everything, right? That whole Europe, Middle East, Africa, you know, they, they'd conquered uh, vast stretches of land. But then when Alexander the Great died, uh, 
without really any kind of an error, it was split between his generals, right? So one of his generals, his land and his armies became what we know as Rome. Uh, one of the other ones was the line of the Ptolemies, right? And they were given the stretches of land that in included uh, Israel, Syria, you know, those areas of the Middle East, Palestine, the Promised Land areas, and these areas of Egypt that they had conquered, um, which included Alexandria. Alexandria was a major city on North Egypt, right, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea there, right? So you've got the Red Sea that kind of comes up this way, and then all this over here is Egypt, and then the Mediterranean Sea is up this way. Well, Alexandria is over here, right? So the Israelites were kind of here, and they went east over, uh, you know, through the Sinai Peninsula and all of that, and then up Saudi Arabia. Further west and north over this way is Alexandria. And Alexandria was a uh, very large community. Uh, it became uh, a very uh, kind of scholarly community. The world's largest library was there. Um, it was one of the wonders of the ancient world, and it was burned, uh, I believe, by Arab invasions, maybe in like the 7th century, uh, somewhere between 700 and 1,000 uh, invasions came in. A part of the invasion is they burned the library and all of those materials, right? So there was a lot of ancient literature that was collected and stored in Alexandria that was lost when they burned all of that. It was, it was one of the, the wonders of the ancient world uh, because it had so many books from antiquity, um, and they just, they burned it. Um, and so, uh, as a book lover, that really offends me, and as a historian, that offends me. And, uh, but, um, and so Ptolemies owned all of this. So, because the Ptolemies were in charge of these regions, it actually created quite an easy thoroughfare for, for Jews wanting to move over to Alexandria because it was under the same leadership, right? And so that's why we see such a significant population of Jews in Alexandria. In fact, this is the place where we have a letter from, you know, I mean, who knows if he's telling the truth or not, but we have a letter from the librarian at Alexandria who said that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews in letter form and sent it to them and it was to the Jewish community there at Alexandria and, you know, as a form of respect um, because he was writing to other well-learned uh, Hebrews that he just didn't put his name on it as a sign of respect, but everybody knew that it was from him. Um, and he wrote, that's why it was basically Jewish in its communication was because it was written to the Jewish community there at Alexandria. So that's, that's what the guy said. I mean, you know, it's hard to know. He's, you know, he's the only witness to that, and he's saying that's how it happened, but, you know, I mean, they, there's no other confirmation of that. You know, it's just, it's just what we have is what he said. So, but, so in all of that community there, um, very scholarly, heavily Jewish, it was out of that that a, a kind of, you know, uh, a movement, if you will, a desire to have the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek because so many of these people now are speaking Greek. And so it was brought to King Ptolemy's attention. I don't know whether he wanted it or whether somebody brought it to his attention, but either way, he gives the decree for the Torah to be translated into, uh, into Greek. And there, there are several tra traditions that say that his first version had five, but, but no one was really happy with the quality of it, and so he ordered the second one, and he had the people in the, the, the priests in Jerusalem, the high priest, to send scholars um, on their behalf to come here and translate the word. And so as the story goes, they sent six from each of the, uh, the 12 tribes to give a total of 72 scholars who made this trip down to Alexandria and according to the letter that we have, uh, the king uh, 
that there were like a seven day feast for them when they got there. And then uh, when the feast was over, he sent them to uh, the island of Pharos uh, to be alone, to translate it uh, undistracted. And uh, it took them 70 days to complete the, the translation. And, uh, and it was one that everyone was happy with. When it was all said and done, um, everyone was satisfied that it was done properly. Um, that it was under the guidance of the Lord. Now later, there comes all kinds of other traditions that that have the appearance of maybe bolstering the story a little bit, that, that all 70 were put in separate rooms and they each did their own translation and they came back and they were all word for word exactly the same. That's, a, that's a, There's somebody that wrote about that and he said that's how it happened, but, but he wrote much later. So it, it kind of has the feeling of of maybe he was embellishing that a little bit. I, you know, I don't know because the earlier ones seem to be a little more practical. That you know, the king brought them down. They worked on it. It's five books of the Bible. There's 70 of them. They worked on it. It took them 70 days, um, and so that's where the 70 then becomes very connected with this book, right? Um, so they call it the Septuagint, right? It comes from this this wording of the 70, right? And so this King Ptolemy was of those lines from Alexander the Great, you know, so one group became Rome, and the southern group were the Ptolemies. Um, that was one of his generals was Ptolemy. And so his line of descendants is where we get King Ptolemy Philadelphus, who is leading here from Alexandria. Uh, he was one of Alexander the Great's you know, uh, he descended from that Alexander the Great. So it's, it's, it's a Greek king, essentially, even though he's down here in Egypt. Um, and so that's why he was wanting to get, uh, you know, a copy done of these scribes because many people in his town were, were Hebrew and everybody's speaking Greek. He speaks Greek. They wanted to get it put into their language. And so that's where it comes from. So that's what we call the Septuagint proper. Then the other books of the Greek Old Testament, uh, just independently at different times, were translated, but we don't have a record of any formal project that was undertaken to do the rest of them. Uh, we just start seeing full uh, canons of the Greek beginning to emerge in the early church. Um, and so, you know, we don't have a clearly defined history and so of, of the other books. But a lot of times when people just say that Septuagint, what they're meaning is, you know, the entire Old Testament in a Greek version, right? Um, but just know in your mind there is a Septuagint proper, which was that original translation of the Torah. Uh, just one other side note that I think is interesting is that the majority uh, the vast majority of the Apostle Paul's quotations, in fact, almost all of them, come from the Septuagint. There are over 300 direct quotations um, in the New Testament that came from the Septuagint, uh, a Greek version of the Old Testament. So the majority of Old Testament references in the New Testament are from this line of texts. They are not from the Hebrew line. They're from the Greek line. Uh, and in fact, the Septuagint was the Bible of the church for the first three or four hundred years, um, you know, it be, until it started be, being translated into Latin. Um, you know, then, then you started seeing language change a little bit and people were more, you know, in, into Latin around 400 and later. But the first 400 years of Christianity, uh, the Septuagint, this Greek version of the text, was the primary uh, thing. And what we'll explore a little bit is that there, um, there appear to be, uh, and we'll explore this a little bit, some places where the Hebrew version has translated in such a way to kind of mask some of the, the things that were used by the early church as direct references to Christ. Now, some, now, they weren't trying to intentionally, at least I don't believe, change the meaning, but in, in any way that they could, in, in some spots at least, um, 
kind of translate it within reason that kind of masks some direct references to Christ. One that I know of for certain is that there is an Old Testament prophecy that says uh, when the Lord, when he comes, will reign from the tree, which the early church used that quite a bit as a reference to Christ. Um, but in the Hebrew translations, they kind of translate that a little differently and you lose that sense of it. And so there, there is kind of the sense, particularly in the early church, I, I, you don't hear many people talking about it in today's church, but there was particularly in the early church many people who were uh, at least uh, leery a little bit of some of the translation decisions of the Hebrew version because the people doing it were not Christian. Right? They were Jews who were trying to maintain that Christianity was not true, right? You know, because the, they were they were Jews. They were not Messianic Jews. They were they were Jews, um, and so they they loved the Old Testament, but you know they they did not adhere to the fact that Christ is the Messiah, and so and they're the ones doing the translating. So in some places, if it was a little iffy. Um, you know, they were more inclined to make it not be a direct reference to Christ if, if it kind of fit without, you know. So I don't think that there's any places where it looks like foul play, where they're intentionally changing things just drastically. But if, if the language allowed it, let's say it that way, to maybe shade a word in a, in a different way that kind of masks some of the overt references to Christ in the Old Testament, then the early church believed that they were doing that. And so they tended to teach that you really needed to have a Greek version of that. And so most of uh, the people in the early church went more with the Septuagint. Right? Um, so I don't have any problem with the Hebrew English Bibles that we have today. But it just does, it is just kind of an interesting thought that the early church. Um, was typically very adamant, like not just a little bit, but adamant, that you needed to adhere to the Septuagint version, right? Okay, so that's enough for week one. Um, you know, I would start on your plan, you know, reading through the Torah, and just, you know, enjoy it. You know, uh, you don't have any other books. I just want you to enjoy reading uh, the Old Testament in the Greek version, okay? <laughs>